Inelasticity is disregarded in many applications of subsurface engineering. However, we're going to see many examples in which uh, we see that inelasticity is quite important. Let's first start with an overview of inelasticity. In the theory of elasticity, we usually have a relationship between stress and strain which is unique. For every strain there is just one possible value of stress. With inelasticity we do not see that. Uh, first of all we have a maximum value of stress which is called a yield stress. That's one of the main characteristics of inelasticity and it is that fixes the possible uh, maximum stress value that a material can take. So this is going to be the first point of inelasticity. Second, when you get to the yield stress, it doesn't mean that the material there is going to blow up into a thousand pieces, but uh, um, opposite to that, the material usually stays together with a finite strength, but stress may not increase anymore, or may increase a little. We're going to see that uh, later on. But in inelastic deformation or in the elastic domain, the material it is still strong. It can support a stress sigma, even though the strain uh, continues to increase. So, um, we still have strength past the yield stress. And third, a characteristic which is very important of inelasticity is that if we were to unload such a material, we will have an irrecoverable strain or a permanent strain. And that's why uh, we call it inelasticity. And that's going to be the third characteristic that we're going to summarize in here. Okay, let's see examples of how this type of, uh, of response happens in many applications of uh, subsurface engineering for obtaining resources from the Earth. Uh, first of all, in exploration, uh, we already have uh, evidence of inelasticity. For example, this formation over here, which has been bent over millions of years, it's like that and it's deformed like that because of inelastic behavior. If you were to release the stresses that are folding this reservoir, it's not going to come back to be a flat uh, formation. Uh, it has been permanently uh, deformed. And sometimes the stresses that deform these layers could be so high that uh, they cause also a shear fracture in the material, which at the large scale is going to be a fault. So a fault is uh, already a, an example of inelasticity uh, past the yield stress. In this example, is uh, we see what uh, we were explaining before, that when you get to the point of failure, the hanging wall and the foot wall, they st still stay next to each other. There is just a displacement and there is a discontinuity, but the fault is still strong, still is able to take load and still able to support what is on top, what is next to the rock, but it has the form in a way that cannot be recovered. Usually this type of uh, faulting is responds to a shear failure and if we assume no cementation, the maximum stress, this value over here, is limited by the frictional strength of the material that we're going to see responds to this law. 
in which the maximum principal stress is a function of the minimum effective principal stress through a friction parameter, where here phi is the friction angle. Okay, so let me put a few indices here. So one is folding, two is defaulting. All right, so we see that in exploration already we have evidence of uh, inelastic behavior behavior in the subsurface. What about during drilling? During drilling, also we are, uh, as we drill, we're breaking the rock, the rock, right? So all of those uh, wellbore cuttings are not going to be joined again to the mother rock, and it, it is a permanent deformation on the on the rock. But also the material that stays around the wellbore is also going to be subjected to deformation and failure that could go beyond the elastic point, not only what you take away, but also what is around. For example, in a typical wellbore, if we have a cross section, and if we have the maximum stress to be applied in this direction, and the minimum stress to be applied in the perpendicular direction, if we look at the cross-section of the wellbore, we often see that at these locations, we are going to find what are called breakouts, which is shear failure, which also responds to this equation. And at these locations, I'm going to find tensile fractures. Those two are examples of stresses going past the limit to which we can have elastic behavior. Here, the, the breakouts, let's assign a number, let's say number three, and the tensile fractures number four. This is going to be a shear failure. This is going to be a tensile failure. Let's go to the next stage. Uh, what happens in uh, completion? Uh, no. Okay, well, let me add also here that this is when we make the wellbore. Uh, we have three and four, and also the, the cuttings that are generated during drilling. Okay, uh, during completion, uh, we prepare the wellbore to production of uh, fluid. And uh, uh, first of all, uh, we might have perforations. A perforation is basically a failure of the rock at a very high strain rate and uh, done here at the near, near the wellbore so that we can extend past the damage area around the reservoir. These perforations are going to be uh, a permanent deformation. Sometimes the perforations may not be enough. So in order to improve production rate, we, we can do is perform a hydraulic fracture. And a hydraulic fracture, let's call it number six, what it's going to do is going to extend the, the, the reach of the wellbore uh, further into the reservoir. So in this example, let's assume that our fracture, we have also perforations here coming out of the plane of the drawing, and our fracture is going to grow this way from out of the plane of the drawing into the formation. Let me try that again. Actually, it doesn't look that nice. I put too much of an angle to that. Okay. So this is going to be the, the fracture uh, which is performed and uh, getting into the reservoir. When we make such a fracture, let me do 
here this is going to be the wallboard and if we look at the at the cross section actually let me do it this way so it's closer to the to what it looks in the drawing on the left if this is a hydraulic fracture that grows out of the wellbore on a top view when you are creating the fracture you're breaking the rock in tension making a, an open mode fracture so already that is inelastic behavior but not only that when you create a fracture very often you alter the state of stress near the fracture which reactivates fractures in shear near the zone of the fracture near the face and as the tip propagates alters the stresses around and what you could have in these uh, cases is the reactivation of these natural fractures and this is often measured with micro seismicity this micro seismicity it's an event of shear failure and there is no uh, other to me no more evident proof that we have plastic deformation when we do hydraulic fracturing uh, than the fact of observing micro seismicity micro seismicity is shear failure shear failure is an inelastic uh, behavior so uh, let me add here fracture reactivation and this is what induces micro seismicity and let's add to that number uh, seven and this happens when you create a uh, hydraulic fracture okay um so now that we have done uh we have drilled our wellbore uh we have uh, completed the World War II to start producing now we start producing what happens when uh, you do production uh, well if you were to lower your pressure too much what you would have is an increase in the effective vertical stress and you will have reservoir compaction usually we refer to reservoir compaction when it is a type of strain which is considerable and and use, usually it is uh, permanent so the reservoir the top of the reservoir may go down in time because of the increased effective vertical stress and if the reservoir is too thick if the reservoir is also close to the surface and if the all the formations on top are relatively compliant what you can also have is a phenomenon of subsidence in this case of the seafloor is the same phenomenon but that propagates to the surface it has been shown that even sometimes when you have uh, such a case in which uh, you have significant deformations uh, due to depletion uh, you can also produce re the reactivation of faults by uh, i hope you can see how all of these formation on top is being dragged uh, down uh, due to the deformation of, of this reservoir so uh, in this case also with uh, with reservoir compaction we can have a uh, full reactivation or reactivation that it is a phenomenon of shear failure as well and some other times by injecting a fluid into the same formation to either to maintain the pressure or to store a fluid over a long time or to push a a hydrocarbon with for example water of a polymer uh, you could also have uh, 
a change of port pressure that might be enough to reactivate a, a fault. So this is going to be a phenomenon of injection within the reservoir. And that might also cause a fault reactivation. So I hope that you know this, that in all these cases, uh, we can see that the type of failure that the rock happens in most cases is related to shear, to tensile failure, and also to compaction. A grain crashing and a few more things that we are going to see are important in order to characterize these uh, permanent uh, deformations. But pretty much we can narrow down these to three types of failure. Again, tensile failure, shear, and compaction.